Are you tired of waking up every day, getting ready, preparing to grind through life? What if there were more than just getting ready, doing the same things over and over again? What if there were more to life than just clocking in? What is it that we're really pursuing? Is there something that we're chasing after? What if we started pursuing God's truth? What if you and I started chasing after God's own heart? Now, if you're like me, you have to be thinking on the surface, none of this makes sense. Why would David, after all that he had going for him, be so stupid to do something like this? Like, shouldn't he have known better? But you see, what we discover is it's not a knowledge problem when it comes to temptation. It's a sin problem. That even the godliest people are not exempt from temptation. And so instead of, that asking, instead of us asking the question, how could David do something like this? What if we turn the question and ask ourselves, how could I? Or better yet, how am I? Today's talk is not just about lust, but we're talking about the temptation of greed and envy and pride and idolatry, all of it. You see, temptation itself is not a sin. Our response to it often is. The second look is where the problem begins. That's when the temptation begins to take shape. And oh, by the way, here's an update on how the world and the church is responding to this type of temptation. According to the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy, 25% of married men in the lifetime of their marriage will engage in an extramarital affair. Meanwhile, 15% of women will do the same. The same study indicates that when it comes to non-sexual relationships, in other words, an emotional affair, 55% of married men will engage in one. Meanwhile, 35% of married women will do the same. The University of Texas released a study that indicated that there is more pornography viewed on Thanksgiving Day than any other holiday and on Sundays more than any other day of the week. Do you know that the porn industry takes in more money annually than Major League Baseball, the NBA, and the NFL combined? You say, well, pastor, that's all studies for the creepy people. That's not my problem. But Jesus says, Anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Back to our text today in verse 1. It may seem surprising to us that David's sin continues, or that David's sin comes at a moment of extreme blessing. I mean, we understand in times of difficulty and adversity, it's, it's in those times sometimes that sin seems more appealing and even more excusable and justifiable. You know, the casual hookups, the emotional affairs, the reckless spending sprees, overeating and cheating and feeding hidden addictions, quitting what God's called you to. It's just something or someone to offer an escape from all the pain, a quick fix to temporary difficulties. But David, David is in a season of blessing. He has the kingdom, Israel, Judah, like the weather's even nice, man. It's springtime. But all of this reminds us that not one person, not one of us, is beyond the reach of temptation. Even a man after God's own heart can fail to guard his heart and rebel against God's will. See, the truth is we have this tendency to forget just how dependent we are upon God. Keith Thomas would say the more self-sufficient we feel, the closer we are to disaster. The Bible says, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. This was a walled city, a very fortified and protected city. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. I want to come back to this. This is springtime. This is a time when militaries are mobilized, when kings go off to war. But for whatever reason, David stays home. He stays home, and in his isolation, he disengages from the things of God, and he opens himself up to temptation. This brings us to our first point today, and that is this, to remain engaged. 
Remain engaged in the things of God. It's so easy, isn't it, in our busy seasons of life to sort of just put God off to the side, to disengage in the things that we're doing here this morning, to get into God's word, to pray, to sing his praises. I will confess to you as your pastor one Sunday evening, and it wasn't all that long ago, I was completely exhausted. Like I woke up from a nap, I got a drink, and I, that got me ready for my next nap. But everyone had went to bed, and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to watch some TV. And so I settled in for a cowboy-themed movie, one that, quite honestly, I didn't think was a big deal for me to watch. I mean, I knew there would be some vulgarity, but I didn't think it would hurt anything. After all, all the kids were in bed. So I thought... Turns out our little six-year-old was bright-eyed and awake in her room. And it was that evening that she learned herself a new, uh, let's call it a cowboy catchphrase. And let's just say it wasn't at all appropriate for school. I know it wasn't appropriate for school because she repeated it at school. And I remember having that conversation, like I'm in panic mode, and I asked her, I said, Kelly, does, does your teacher know that daddy's a pastor? And she said, uh-huh. I said, Dad, does she know where daddy is a pastor? She said, I don't think so. I said, here's what I want you to do. If your teacher asks you where daddy's a pastor, you tell her the Baptist church. <laughs> I made that last part up. I didn't tell her that. My point is this. Disengagement from the things of God will always lead to greater temptation. Idleness is not simply a lack of activity. Idleness is activity toward no constructive purpose. In fact, I heard it said not that long ago that idle time is idle time. A late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, this word in the Hebrew for uh, beauty here is dobai, which means, literally translated, it means fine. Now, rarely does the Bible rate people's beauty, but here it is literally saying that Bathsheba is fine. I'm just leaving it there. It's what the Bible says. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, normally in Hebrew writing, you wouldn't name both the father and the husband. But there's a purpose behind the context here. They're trying to remind David to remember who she is. They're saying, bro, like, she is married to your bodyguard. Like, one of, it is, she is one of your best friend's wives. Dude, what are you doing? You see, God is giving David time to come to his senses, to realize what he's getting himself into. But listen to me, corruption always begins when contentment ends. Everyone else is out to war, but David stays home and he disengages from the things of God. Friend, there's some, some application for you and I today. That when you don't have community, you won't have any immunity to the schemes of the enemy. Listen, I know there's value in having quiet time alone. Trust me, I have kids too. And I, I, there are introverts in this world, I get it. But I also know for many of you, man, you are dealing with some grief and heartache and suffering this season. And it's going to be very, very easy for you to just stay away from everything and everyone and try to grind out this holiday season or maybe the rest of your entire life all by yourself. But I'm telling you, isolation is Satan's playground. There is a danger there. Find a group of people. Find a tribe that will love you enough to speak biblical truth with and to you. I would submit to you that when faced with temptation, choose community. As a preventative measure to increase temptation, choose community. Sun Tzu in his piece called The Art of War said, Do not linger in dangerous and isolated places. You see, temptation isn't always about what we want, but oftentimes where it's placed. In his book, Atomic Habits, James Clear termed a phrase, choice architecture. And in it, he cited a Boston hospital that was seeking to increase health among its workers. So in what appeared to be a very subtle move, they relocated the bottled water from the back of the cafeteria in, into a display case at the checkout counter. And what they found is that within one week's time, sales of water went up by 25%. 
It's the same reason why Coca-Cola pays an insane amount of money every year so that their product can be placed at the end cap. Why? Because they want to maximize exposure. And this is how Satan works when it comes to temptation. He knows our danger zones. We all have them. And he will maximize the exposure so that we take the base, so that we're tempted by these oases of temptation. I think of it this way. I love to eat at Olive Garden. But there are things in that, like the, the bottomless bowl of pasta, like you could try to tempt me with that all day long and I'm not touching it, it's gross. Now my kids, they'll make themselves sick, but for me, it's just salad and breadsticks all day long. Now you give me a box of Krispy Kremes and we got problems, I've got problems. But we all know it's far more serious than that. Because the truth is like no one wakes up one day and wants to end up in jail. But you put yourself in a place where you couldn't control your anger. Like you didn't wake up one day and seek to destroy the people that you love, but you put yourself in a place of temptation where your lustful desires were stronger than your willpower. Like you didn't want to see the friendship come to an end, but you had your chance for revenge and you took it and now there's no going back. It is the oasis of temptation. It's so appealing in the beginning, but it leads to destruction in the end. And so I plead with you today, church, to know the temptation, danger zones, and locations in your life and steer clear of those. So let's get a little personal now. Where are those places for you in your life? Where are those areas that you find yourself most vulnerable Do they honor God? Or do they feed your greed, lust, and pride? J.D. Greer said it is far easier to avoid temptation than it is to resist sin. There was a study not all that long ago that came out, and they, they coined the term HALT-B. And the study indicates that you and I are most vulnerable to temptation and to sin when we find ourselves hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and bored. And so it was with David. Boredom becomes a battleground of temptation. David was essentially doing the Old Testament version of what you and I do today when we're bored and we scroll through images on phones. Uh, you know, maybe in the beginning it was just an innocent text message. It was just a couple drinks and the list goes on and on. And this is where David finds himself. The Bible says, and David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message. And in the only recorded words of Bathsheba in this entire account, she said, I'm pregnant. Little compromises lead to big consequences. This is how sin so quickly compounds and the Bible says that eventually it leads to death. James says temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Friends, I know this is not comfortable, but we have to be serious about this. Like, how, how do you handle temptation in your life? Do you have a plan? How do you react? The reality is we will do one of two things. We will flirt with it or flee from it. And if you are not running away from it, friend, you are entertaining it. Some of us, man, the game we really play is how close can I get without crossing the line? And then it progresses into how much over the line can I go and still manage the consequences? And I'm just saying, church, we know this to be true. If you flirt with fire, you're going to eventually get burned. It breaks my heart to know that some of you are on the brink of utter ruin and you don't even realize it. 